Welcome everyone to our session today, um, our second day of Kids First. You are in the room for sensory story times. What does that mean and how do I do it? And our guest uh, presenter today is Lacey Wolf. She is a pediatric outpatient speech language pathologist and a clinical team lead at ChildServe in Ames. During her career, Lacey has served countless kids with various diagnoses from ages birth to 22, who all required their own treatment plans and accommodations in order to create the most beneficial therapy sessions. Lacey is passionate about the importance of literacy and the role that speech language, language pathologists play in providing therapeutic interventions for children who are struggling with literacy. Through ChildServe, Lacey has been able to partner with the United Way of Story County and First Book to get hundreds of books into the homes of children all over Story County. So please join me in welcoming Lacey and we'll let you take it away. Thanks, Lacey. All right, thank you, Becky. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, it's nice to see all your names on a screen, uh, not your faces today, but that's okay. If you're brave and wanna show your face, go for it. Um, I do work in Ames. I work and live in Ames at ChildServe. Um, literacy is my passion. I have thousands of books at home for my own kids. And um, the first book project with the United Way of Story County has been awesome here. Um, the, the hundreds of books that we've given away uh, has been incredible the last couple of months. So that's been really, really exciting. And um, I love having so many books in my cabinet, in my office, um, and I love seeing them go into the homes of kids. So um, with that, uh, I have presented this topic to our local library here in Ames. And um, so I work closely with uh, the families in the community that have children on the autism spectrum. And so I kind of hear both um, sides of you know, the family's really wanting a story time for their children, and I also see the library and them wanting to provide that, um, and how do they make that work, and, um, and so I um, really appreciate being able to partner with them to, to make that successful and to make that happen. So um, two things I'm very passionate about, kids and reading, um, and so this just comes together really easily, and um, so I'm excited to tell you guys about it. So. Um, let's, I'm just going to start with a brief overview of what um, autism is so that you guys, um, I know that I think it's more in the news than it has been ever, so people are probably pretty aware of what autism is, um, but I just want to briefly touch on that. So it is a spectrum of disorders, which means that, um, you know, we have very high functioning children with autism where you really may not know that um, it's something that's a part of their lives. And we have children on the other side who are nonverbal and um, are unable to communicate with their family members, their friends, um, and really struggle with a lot of things in daily life. So there's a wide range, which um, going into this thinking about the wide range we know that there's not one size fits all for kids. So there's not one program that's going to work. There's not one activity that's going to work for all kids. So really trying to be flexible when you're thinking about doing a story time is really key um, to make it successful um, for a wide variety of kids. Um, so typically signs are going to appear during childhood. Like I mentioned, the person's ability to communicate and interact with others is affected. Um, sometimes it's, it feels like they can't or don't want to interact, and that's not always true. Um, it's just more difficult, and um, the pre preferred way of interacting with somebody is not going to be eye-to-eye -eye contact, but maybe just in the general vicinity of that person and playing with a common toy um, or sharing some experience that they enjoy doing um, that may not be what you think is typical for a child to do. Um, a lot of kids uh, on the spectrum have either they're oversensitive or undersensitive to different inputs. So loud sounds are really difficult for them. So you'll see children covering their ears or maybe they love to crash and jump and climb. Um, so they're very physical and they're seeking that sensory input of I want to feel all the things on my body. Um, let me tackle you. Let me run into, you know, run into the couch and jump on the cushions and um, just really looking for that input. 
There's other kids who have a very sensitive um, touch in their fingers and they can't stand the touch of anything wet or things that are crunchy or um, a variety, like a sticky thing. So there's just different things that, you know, we all kind of have our own issues um, of what we prefer and what we don't prefer, but it just is a very heightened thing in, um, in children with autism. Um, so people with autism may display a certain set of behaviors. So things that we hear about generally, I think on the news or maybe hands flapping, spinning around, um, repeating certain phrases, over and over. So that might be some cues as a child is pretty young that if we're seeing um, spinning in circles a lot or flapping hands or jumping or walking on toes, uh, those are some red flags that we're looking for as therapists um, to be aware of that this child may have autism. Uh, there's no single known cause of autism. So um, answering a family's why is, is really difficult. Um, and we have really, though, a very increased awareness of autism now than um, even when, you know, a decade ago when I was um, first coming out of grad school, we really have a much better grasp of what these uh, children are experiencing early on in their lives, um, which just leads to us being able to provide intervention sooner um, and, and hopefully getting better outcomes because we're able to get these children into therapy um, you know, between the ages of one and two rather than at five and six, like it was um, a while ago. Uh, the prevalence of autism um, can vary looking at the source that you've got, but it's about one in 59 uh, births in the U.S. So that's, there's been an increase um, from 2002 to 2010. There's a pretty decent increase and um, we can speculate why that is, but uh, those are the numbers that we've got. Autism occurs um, in all racial, ethnic, and um, SES groups, so um, it's not differentiating between those groups. Um, it's pretty commonly known that boys are more likely to be diagnosed with autism than girls. Um, it, that does make it more, a little more difficult for girls to get diagnosed with autism, um, so we always want to be careful that we're not um, passing those kids to the side just because it's a girl and not a boy and, and not thinking about that. Um, but overall, more than 3.5 million Americans live um, with autism, and I think that's a really big number that we need to be aware of. And I know today we're talking about kids and what we're looking at in kids, um, but we need to think about this as adults too, because they're those parents coming into your libraries to do story time that very well likely are on the autism spectrum and um, understanding how their brains think and work and maybe what they're experiencing um, gives us all a little compassion and a little bit better understanding to, to interact with them and engage. So um, children or adults with autism um, might have some of these characteristics that we look for in our therapy um, sessions are just not pointing at objects or showing interest in them. So um, we'll ask families, you know, do they ever point to something in the sky, a bird or a plane or do they point out something that they see in their room that they really like? And if we see a lack of pointing, that's a red flag for us. Um, children with autism may not look at objects, so they may not be looking at the book that you are doing story time with. Um, and that doesn't mean they're not listening uh, at all. It just means being able to focus on one object and look at that is difficult. Um, faces are especially difficult. Um, for some kids with autism and that direct eye contact is uncomfortable. So don't give up uh, if you feel like the child won't engage with you, won't look in your eyes, won't watch the or look at the book. Um, be confident that, you know, they're probably listening um, and and so just keep going with that. Um, kids and adults on the spectrum do have a hard time relating to other people sometimes or they may not show interest sometimes. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're not interested at all ever. So again, everything's a spectrum. So just really thinking about um, if the child is walking around the room during story time, not looking at the book, not sitting with anybody, um, that doesn't mean that that child's not listening. Um, and so keep reading the story, keep trying to re-engage that child every once in a while to see if you can bring the child closer to the circle and closer to being engaged. Um, but it just, it looks different for kids. And a lot of times kids on the spectrum are 
uh, walking around the room, around the outside of the room. That's, that's their comfort level. They're keeping their body regulated. They need to do that um, to just to ground themselves and feel okay. So um, we all tap our feet. We um, chew gum. We might chew on a pencil or tap a pencil. We all do something to regulate our bodies. A lot of times kids with autism are regulating their bodies by uh, walking around a room or um, clapping their arms or spinning in circles. So um, those things are okay. We don't wanna tell the kids to stop doing that. That's okay. Um, the only time we're gonna intervene is if the child is in danger um, for themselves, if they're endangering themselves or other people. Um, otherwise, a few circles never hurt anybody and it's kind of fun. So um, like I talked about before with being oversensitive or undersensitive, some kids on the spectrum really don't want um, that personal touch. They don't want to be hugged or cuddled because they're very sensitive to it. Doesn't mean that they don't want to be loved or they don't love their caregivers. It just, their body, it feels different to them. So um, we work in therapy to really figure out what kind of touch they do like and, um, and how to work um, on that, being able to not, the other touches to not hurt them or feel like it's painful because that is um, something adults with autism have expressed that sometimes touch is, is painful for them. Um, other things to think about is that uh, they might appear to be unaware when someone is talking to them, but they're going to respond to other sounds. So many times a parent might say like, I just am not sure if my child can hear. They just don't respond to their name. They don't respond to anything. Um, you know, that I'm saying or sounds that I hear. Um, but it's, again, just a wide variety of things that the child is able to focus in on. Um, and so don't give up and don't assume that your words aren't being heard. Um, just know that responses all look different and that's okay. Um, and the last point says that, you know, children on the spectrum may be very interested in people, but they're just not sure how to interact and engage. So that's what we work on in therapy. Um, and, and that's why we, we keep doing what we do because we know, um, we know that they're bright, wonderful kids and um, we just gotta figure out you know, what's best for them and how to keep working with them. So um, I would say definitely continue to partner with um, professionals in your area to, to help you understand children and their parents because the parents are the experts on the kids um, when you've got questions about what the child may prefer um, and how they like to interact and engage. So some early signs that we're looking at that may be something um, in, that you would see when you're in your libraries um, and just not quite sure what's going on is if a child has a lack of um, expressive language when they're a child. So that's, you know, when they're little and they're not saying their first words um, or maybe not babbling as much, um, that's a sign for us. The repetitive use um, of language or motor movements like I've talked about. So twirling objects, twirling their own bodies, hand flapping is a sign for us. Um, that limited eye contact that I mentioned, the um, difficult interaction with peers or just maybe a lack of interest in peers. Um, the lack of spontaneous or make-believe play is also a sign. Um, that's something we address in, in speech therapy is teaching children how to play and how to engage with, you know, the farm animals in the barn and the sounds that they make and, and playing together that way or puppets and um, lots of pretend play that we can do um, can be difficult for kids on the spectrum. Another thing that we really notice for those um, younger kids is uh, just their intent focus on one part of an object. So if they really wanna watch the wheels on a train or a car spin, versus playing with the whole car and moving it around um, is that's another sign for us that um, this child may be on the spectrum. So sensory processing disorder is something that goes along um, with autism, but also can be something that's diagnosed first um, in a child before they're diagnosed with autism. So I just wanted to talk about that briefly in case that's something that you hear a family say to you, or if you know like a family that has a child diagnosed with sensory processing disorder, um, it's, you know, can kind of feel the same, um, but also it is different than autism. So 
uh, sensory processing disorders, just talking about how the brain really has a difficult time receiving and responding to information brought into the body by the different senses. So um, the information that's coming in is just not processed the same and it's not processed correctly. So, um, you know, the bright lights that you don't even notice in a building or in the library may be absolutely terrible for someone with sensory processing disorder. Those lights may inhibit their ability to even be in their room. Um, so, you know, it can be as extreme as that. It can also be, you know, sound specific where um, you may not ever hear the sound of your laptop running or the sound that the lights make or the water fountain um, turning on and, and making those sounds. Um, but a child that has sensory processing disorder may hear all of those things um, that other people just aren't aware of. And then that's something that inhibits them from being able to, to be happy and to fully participate in something because they might be distracted by that. So, um, so that's just kind of a general overview of the background of kind of what we're thinking with um, children with autism and what they're experiencing um, and what um, life might be like for them. So that I think it's really important to have that knowledge to keep that in mind when we're planning sensory story times. Um, there's so many factors that we need to think about that could um, really play into the success of story times. So um, it's really a lot of environment modifications that need to be made. And um, as someone who's worked in this field for almost a decade, it's um, amazing once you start making accommodations um, with lights and sounds uh, for other kids, how much it kind of relieves myself. And I don't want the lights to be really bright. And I notice those quieter sounds that other people don't notice. And um, it's really eye-opening and it's a good learning experience. And I think it's uh, kind of nice to make some accommodations for all of us. So um, some things to think about that we, um, do here at child serve and individual therapy sessions that can easily um, be done in the library um, are things like visual schedules. And these are so huge for kids so that they know what is expected of them. Um, thinking about our lives right now and how unplanned they are. Um, think about your life two months ago and how um, you're either using your smartphone or um, a paper calendar or something to keep yourself organized. You knew when this current was, you planned around it, you have things scheduled out, you know what you're doing from the beginning to the end of your day. Um, and kids thrive off that as well. They, they want to know. Um, sometimes they don't have the words to express that, um, so they may just appear, appear frustrated. Um, but putting a schedule into place is really key to keep kids uh, grounded in what's going to happen and so they know what's going to happen. So um, a visual schedule can be, you know, for a, a child's entire day, or it could be just for the one activity that we're doing. So I put this one up as hand washing, and honestly, I used it nine months ago in my first presentation before uh, hand washing was such a huge deal um, that's talked about every day. But um, this is one that we have for kids that we post in the bathroom just so they know um, from beginning to end what they need to be doing to wash their hands. So um, in the library during story time, having a visual schedule up for, um, you know, if first we're going to do, uh, and sometimes so for this hand washing one, it's, you know, moving from left to right and it's two lines. Um, I actually prefer to start at the top and then go down so that the kids can see each of those steps. Um, and so when we're starting at the top, you know, maybe it's first we're going to sing our song, we're gonna read our book, um, then we're gonna do our sensory activity, we're gonna sing one more song, and then we're done. And so having those visual schedules up on the wall um, or next to you, wherever you're at, so that the kids can see the whole schedule um, what I like to do is to really point it out to say, okay, first we're going to start up here and we're going to start with our um, music time. And once music time is over, have a child take a turn coming up and tearing that schedule off, having it Velcroed onto something and putting it in the all done basket so they can see, okay, that one's gone. And now the next one we're going to do is to read our book. And then that's over and we're going to take that one off and we're going to put it in our all done basket and then we're gonna go down to our sensory experience. 
um, be, having kids interact with this schedule, keeping that schedule the same every week for story times is really key um, so that they know when I go in here, I'm gonna get to do a song, I get to read a book, I get to play in my sensory stations, and then I'm gonna sing another song, and then we're gonna be all done. Maybe not putting home at the end because you don't know where the families are going. And if you say home, and the kid thinks they're going home, but then they have to go to the doctor, um, you don't wanna be responsible for that meltdown. So um, just putting all done at the end because then it's obviously different for each child that's there um, is what I would recommend doing. But having that, um, that schedule laid out and, and not being specific about the song that you're gonna sing and the book that you're gonna read allows you to keep one picture schedule for each time um, and gives that predictability to the, the children and the families about song, story, sensory experience, another song, and then we're all done. Um, that's, that makes it easier for you and planning. Um, and you know, to be honest, like the name of the song may not be important to the child. It's really just that they have a song or a book. So um, that's what I do with my visual schedules. I do top to bottom. And I, um, once we're done with the activity, I take it off and put it in the all done basket so that the child can see we're moving on to the next one. Um, again, if you have questions about anything, please feel free to, to uh, send those in the chat and um, I can answer those as, as we're going. Um, so with those pictures and those schedules that we talked, um, that I was just talking about, being able to um, have the pictures with the written word on it for uh, that literacy, literacy support is really great. So um, if we're gonna use, you know, a quiet picture because this is the quiet area, um, having, you know, please be quiet on there, you can have a phrase or you can just have the word quiet. Um, if you've got um, expectations for, if you've got chairs set up in your story time situation, um, you can put the picture of the chair with the word below it and label all the chairs on the back so that you're building that literacy um, for those kids. You can also um, put that cute little picture with read on it if they have special reading corners. Um, but those are just, um, it's always good to have the image with, with the text combined together um, because that's just promoting that literacy even more for those kids. So here's one of my favorite products um, that we use in our clinic. Um, these are really easy, really affordable um, light covers that go over our fluorescent lights. So um, the first round that we bought, um, we bought the light blue ones. And um, those light blue ones, I got some feedback from the therapist that it almost um, was distracting to the kids because it was blue on top of white. And so we're trying to decrease the distractions from the light, but then we put blue up on the ceiling and then it made it distracting. So um, we use the white ones now. Um, we've ordered those and they have magnets. Um, if you look at that picture on each end and then in the middle. So within a matter of 30 seconds, when I get those, I can put them up on the ceiling. They do fold in half. So if you don't have a long light that you are needing to cover, you can fold them in half. Um, I know they make the plastic like actual fluorescent light covers. Um, and you can buy those in different colors and, and dimmers to, to dim the lights a little bit. Um, I would just caution with, if you do do something like this to um, make sure that you're not buying something that's bright or patterned because then you may have a child that is totally focused on the ceiling and looking at the cool, awesome pattern that you put up there instead of uh, the story and the songs and the, the programs that you guys have planned. So um, lights are really, really distracting for a lot of kids on the spectrum. Uh, so trying to control your environment um, to decrease the amount of light that you've got is, is really key. Um, bright sunlight in windows um, can hurt their eyes. So, you know, if a kid comes in in sunglasses, great, let them keep their sunglasses on. Maybe that's something that you can keep um, in your you know, basket of goodies for kids to put on if they need to wear some sunglasses if you're having a hard time controlling the light in your space. Um, but that's, um, you know, I have kids who tell me they can't even look at the whiteboard because they can't stand the reflection off the whiteboard. Um, so it is really a, a thing that happens and um, 
these lights are, these covers are great for that. I noticed we have a question come in, so I'm going to read that. How long or like how many minutes are the story time programs um, aiming for and what are the general age of the children? So um, talking through just in general how many minutes um, for these activities, I would say, um, you know, we're coming in and doing a, a, if you're doing a song with the kids, you know, plan, a, you're going to plan about that five minutes for the song and the movement, you know, starting it, ending it. Um, story time, I would really try to keep to 10 minutes. Um, if the kids are walking around the room, if they're able to sit on the carpet, great. Um, but I would not expect the kids to be on their bottoms, seated and focused for more than 10 minutes. Um, I've seen where, you know, you go in and you sit down and maybe do one activity, but it's sitting. And then you do the story, which can be 10 minutes. And like at 15 minutes, you see all the kids wiggling and they can't handle it. And they're trying to, you know, they start moving. So I think 10 minutes is a really good goal for story time. Um, and if a child makes it five minutes, great. Let, you know, that's awesome. If they walk around or stand for the rest of it, that's okay too. Um, and then after that 10 minute story time, I'd get up and get moving again. Um, if you're doing a sensory experience, which I'm going to talk about that in a little bit, um, doing that for, you know, 10, 10 to 15 minutes and then coming back for um, maybe a wrap up activity of like a goodbye song or something like that. So really looking at, I think, a 30 minute experience from beginning to end is a really, really good place to start. Um, we do our therapy sessions for a lot of children are at 30 minutes, and that's because um, when we're asking them to do therapy, we're asking them to do work. And that's not always easy work for them. So um, if you think about yourself, if someone's asking you to do something that's difficult and focused for 30 minutes, after that, you're like, okay, I'm good. Thank you. Um, let me have a break now. And obviously, story time, you get to move and sing and interact. So you're not giving that demanding one-on-one -on -one attention. Um, but again, you have a wide range of kids. And if you're talking about a very fresh young two-year-old, um, 30 minutes I think is a really good good aim. And they've got their parents there with them. And I think part of the parent education you do with them is, um, is saying like, it's okay if your child doesn't sit for the whole story time. It's okay if you guys need to move around the room um, and really giving that flexibility to the families and just knowing like, do your best. And the kids, if we keep to that consistent schedule, will learn, um, what comes next, they learn the routine, um, and they're able to kind of build their ability to participate in the full, the full story time. Um, really good question, thank you. So it's probably my favorite slide, um, fidgets, sensory items, weighted items for kids. Um, this is where I would have passed around a bucket with all my fun stuff um, for you guys to be able to experience. So um, I've just put a few things up here uh, that you guys could have available. So um, having a bucket available of quiet items that kids can keep in their hands and play with to help them stay engaged and regulated during that 10 minute story time um, is really key. So um, the first one is that um, the puppy that you see there, that's from Amazon. And that's um, a weighted, it's a weighted puppy. So it's meant to be like on the child's lap. Um, and my own daughter has um, undiagnosed ADHD. Uh, she's four, but her attention span is, is really minimal. And we, um, we ordered her one of these animals. And when we're reading books together, we put that on her and it really um, helps her focus and just be able to attend. Otherwise, her body is super wiggly and all over the place. So um, we've also made homemade ones where we just got out fleece and we went to the store and bought a bunch of beans and we <laughs> we uh, we sewed up a you know just a regular square um, pillow and instead of stuffing in it, it's got beans in it. And so she loves that too. And that's a really easy, cheap way to do it. The animals are a little expensive. Um, and then if you've got 10 kids in the room and they all want an animal, you're looking at a pretty big cost. But um, that is something pretty amazing that you can buy on Amazon um, or make your own version with beans and, and just sewing those up into little small pillows. 
for their laps for them to be able to hold. Um, so question is, how would you recommend a sensory bottle to have available during the story time? So I didn't put a picture of a sensory bottle, um, but yeah, using just a clear bottle, I would do plastic probably instead of glass, just in case they um, drop it on their friend or something. If they get hurt, um, plastic is a little bit softer, but uh, in the, I wish I could point to my screen for you and you could see it, but the fidget one, um, that fidget box where kind of below that red arrow is, um, it's laying on its side, but that is something that stands up and it's got that colored ink inside. So it, it goes back and forth when you turn it um, to see how um, to just watch the drops go down in the colors. But um, yeah, those sensory bottles with like glitter and different colors in them to be able to just shake up or um, to, to have in their hands to do. So a lot of kids just need something to play with in their hands. So um, the squishies that you can buy at Amazon or Target Dollar Spot um, or Dollar Tree. So I know Target during different seasons, it seems to be the spring most of the time where they have like different um, like rabbits or things that the, in these like squishy material, um, those are super fun and stretchy. So they come in um, all different sorts of characters and animals and some have eyes and you squeeze them and then the eyes get really big. But um, squishies are really great for kids to be able to hold on to. You can spray them down and clean them um, and they, they come clean. So that's really nice. Um, the Dollar Tree little animals, those are actually washcloths, um, but they're my favorite favorite Dollar Tree item because they're a dollar and they're super cute and they're small enough that the kids' hands can fit into them. Um, they're durable because they're meant to um, be washed. So they're just fun. You could cut the loop off the top if you wanted to, um, or you could keep it so you could hang them up if, um, if you had a place for that. But those are just fun. They're a different texture for the kids to be able to play with. Um, the, and then that fidget toy set, I've never purchased that set, but I liked um, the items that it had in it. The only thing that I said to avoid was like those little finger trap things. Um, I can really see kids putting those in their mouths and chewing on them, um, and they could shove that whole thing in their mouth pretty easily. So I would say, say stay away from anything that, um, that a child can shove the whole thing into their mouth, um, because that's really not what we want. Um, and, and any child, but specifically kids with autism may put more things in their mouth because they're just experiencing it um, and engaging with the toy in a different way. So when we're wanting to buy things for a sensory bucket to be able to just regulate and sit, we wanna make sure that they're safe, that the kids can't shove it in their mouths um, the, the entire way and that you're able to clean them. So like I said, your disinfectant sprays can to clean the squishies, those washcloths go in the, the washing machine easily. Um, the pets that you can buy, the weighted ones, um, they unzip and so you can wash the cover. Um, all of those are, are very easily washed. So um, those are what is so fun about sensory story time, I think, is just the different fidgets. And I would really encourage you when we're not all quarantined um, to go to Dollar Tree and explore their toy aisle and just see like what different things you can buy. Um, they always have different small balls that are good, um, good size for kids to have in their hands, kind of like stress balls um, that you can buy. Um, they have squishies at times. They have um, the washcloths something that, you know, it, you'd think like, that's really weird. Why would I buy that? But on the kitchen side of the store, sometimes they'll have like ladybug dish scrubbers. And so it's just a cute little ladybug on top and it's the scrub on the bottom. Some kids really like that. They like the, um, the stronger feeling of that scrub brush. They like that it's a ladybug on top um, and they play with that. So uh, nothing is is off limits as far as like, oh, that's a kitchen kitchen item. It's not classified as a toy. Um, we use all sorts of things that are are not what they're supposed to be. Uh, the facial scrubbers that like fit on your hand that they have at Dollar Tree, that's like supposed to exfoliate your face. Those are perfect. Those give a different um, little sensory input. Kids like to put them on their hands and and they'll scrub their own hands or their faces. Um, and, little uh, microfiber cloths for cleaning. They, um, all of those kinds of things, like the possibilities are endless. So um, I would really not go spend a ton of money 
um, putting together sensory boxes and I would ask, um, or I would just go to Dollar Tree and, and start exploring to see what you can find that, that feels soft or feels a little bit scratchy or has a different texture um, and start building them up that way. So, um, I, sorry, you can tell, I love sensory stuff, I love fidgets. So um, when you're thinking about putting together your story times, building in movement breaks, like I talked about um, for those kids um, in those structured activities. So um, whether that's a song that you're playing that's got awesome actions that you do with it, if you're just doing a general song like animal actions um, and doing the movements to that, or if you're reading a book that is specifically, you know, has the kids are dancing in it or hopping or skipping, um, or maybe they're building a tower, having the kids get up and do those actions um, with you is, is great to be able to keep their bodies moving. Um, like I said, like the worst thing you can do is to expect the kids to come in and sit um, for really any longer than 10 minutes um, because it's just difficult for their little bodies. And I know that's not atypical of any child um, that's young, but um, really when we're talking about sensory story time, you know, in my mind, those ages of like two to six are probably what you're going to get if you're doing this during the school year, during the day. Um, but if you're doing it um, on a Saturday, or in the evening um, or some as summer programming, you really may get kids that are gonna be older, um, seven, eight, nine years old, and you might feel like um, what you've planned isn't appropriate for them, um, but that really may not be the case. Um, if they're able to participate and be successful in that environment, like that's wonderful. So even if they're nine and you read The Very Hungry Caterpillar, which you feel like, oh, well, they've probably heard that a million times and they're not interested anymore. Um, they might have the story memorized and they might be able to engage in your questions and they know what's going on. Um, and for them to be successful is, is super great too. So um, don't discount those older kids as, as, um, as feeling like you didn't provide for them. And as you get going, if you've got an older group, um, then that's maybe when you can explore a couple different story times um, that you're providing a little bit different um, experience for younger kids versus older kids. Um, but I mean, one thing to keep in mind though is that the child might be nine chronologi chronologically um, by their birth date but um, maybe functioning more at a, a five-year-old level um, with their language. And so um, that's always something to keep in mind that um, they might be bigger than, than what they're able to really um, communicate with you. So um, let's see. So headphones, I think that's become something a little more um, mainstream. My own, uh, my oldest two girls are in first grade and fourth grade, and they both requested noise canceling headphones for school. And um, they don't have attention issues, they don't have sensory issues, but they really just want to be able to block out the noise. So um, headphones are a really great thing to have available for kids if it's too loud for them. Um, you know, during music time, having the music blaring is probably not a great idea. Um, having it a little bit softer for kids so they're not overwhelmed by those that loud noise and then having those headphones available so that um, they can participate and maybe they just want to do the actions and dance along and 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 the music isn't as important to them um, those are headphones are always really great to have on hand um, those are easily disinfected with alcohol wipes um, quickly in between kids so um, I'm pretty sure our own library here in Ames has headphones available um, for kids at all times instead of just story time as well. Um, but that's something that they've that they've had and um, is, is really easy to provide for families. So um, I would love for everyone's story time to include um, sensory experience stations. So um, think of like things that might make you cringe as an adult um, as like, what, like, why would we do this? And kids are like, this is the best thing ever. So um, either getting like clear buckets that can stay on the floor, if that's kind of your setup, um, the clear buckets from Dollar Tree, Target, Walmart that are like shoebox size, they're like 97, 97 cents, a dollar, something like that. They've got plastic or the lids on top. 
Um, you can make smaller bins that way if you want um, each child to have their own designated bin, um, or you can do bigger tubs that might sit on the floor um, if you think maybe a couple children um, might be sharing those tubs. But um, the smaller ones are a little bit easier probably to manage for storage. And if something happens to one, you're not throwing away a ton of materials. It's just the size of that, that clear container. Um, but what do you put in those buckets? Um, we're trying to provide a sensory experience of all different varieties. So um, I know libraries are awesome with all those fun, colorful scarves. Um, I saw our own librarian, Bree, was uh, doing story time this morning on Facebook and it, she had the scarves out. Um, so just putting the scarves in a bucket so kids can dig their hands in and see how that feels. Um, dry beans. So um, going to the store and buying beans and dumping them in a bucket. Um, kids love to dig their hands into those beans um, and it's clean. It's not messy. Uh, you could... Um, if you had, you know, 10 buckets of beans and you've got 10 kids in your story time, if, um, your story talked about different vehicles or different foods, you could um, hide those foods or vehicles down in the beans and then it's like a scavenger hunt and they have to try to find them. Um, so, you know, that's working on story retail as far as if they find the object, they can tell you what happened with it in the story. It's working on their recall for just remembering what was in the story. You can put pictures um, next to each bin as far as what's in there and here's the objects you're looking for and they can match those objects once they find them. Um, there's lots of great things that you can do to build literacy and engagement through those buckets. So um, rice, you can do the same thing with, super affordable if you have to replace it. Um, just hiding stuff in the rice, super messy, but it <laughs> vacuums up. Um, cotton balls. So that's a funny one that a lot of kids don't like to touch, um, but we work on that and we get used to it. So um, cotton balls are fun to, to fill in there. Dry noodles, um, you can dye the noodles if you want them to be different colors. You could do a whole rainbow of different noodles in, in different buckets um, if we're working on colors that day. Um, that would be super fun to do that. And again, hide those objects in there, have the pictures there so they know what they're looking for and then they can match. Um, once they find those objects. Moon dough, a little bit messier, um, but it can stay together. Um, that's something else fun to have in those buckets. And then um, bead necklaces, so like Mardi Gras necklaces. As a parent, we have so many of those things in our house, um, and I hate them because they get tangled up and trying to keep them separate, but if you gather them all up and dump them in a bucket, um, they're really fun and they make noise uh, to be able to dig your hands through and to play with and to just kind of um, mess around with. So I think that's a really good use for necklaces that I typically throw out <laughs> when my children are in bed. <laughs> um, Mundo is like, uh, it's a, it's a, like a, kin uh, the kinetic sand. So it squishes together and it's a sand that stays together and forms. Um, it's not it's not wet like a play-doh, but it's it has more moisture in it than um, than regular sand. So regular sand, you'd have to actually add the water to be able to build anything. But kinetic sand or moon dough, um, it, it molds together, and then um, and then when you're done with it, you can just break it apart and it stays. Um, I mean, it, it it just goes back. You can just keep reshaping it. So um, thank you for sending the link on how to do that. That's awesome. Um, yeah, so you can, I've never tried making it, but um, I'm sure it can be done. So it, it does get messy, but again, you can vacuum it up. Um, cookie sheets are great with the edges or baking sheets, um, and then put the, the container on top of that um, so that you kind of have a good way to collect the mess and, and to clean it up. So, um, yeah, so, uh, more language considerations for your story time. So um, we've kind of talked about this, but picture cues are really critical um, for verbal directions. So uh, the worst thing that you can do for um, kids is, you know, on this that have autism are to give them four different directions really quickly um, one time and just expect them to remember all of them. So 
um, again with the scarves, I just put together for you guys on this PowerPoint a really simple four-step direction of what you're wanting the kids to do. So, um, you know, the first thing, the picture that you've got out for them is we're going to go get a scarf and you've got a picture of exactly what the container looks like with the scarves in it, um, where you guys keep them. So they're going to grab their scarf and then our next expectation for them is to go stand on the circle. So um, those, the circle that I'm showing on my PowerPoint is uh, those the rubber circles that come in a variety of colors. Uh, those I think are really great if you can have um, a really solid surface. I know that most of our libraries have really beautiful rugs and maybe you've got a really good setup already for kids to pick a letter or pick an animal or pick a shape for them to sit on and that's awesome. Um, if you're going to be working in an area that that's not the case, uh, those rubber, um, rubber circles or dots are really nice to be able to put out so the kids know this is my spot and this is my space. Um, so the directions for you know, what, what we need to do to be able to get the scarf, we're gonna show the picture of how to go get the scarf, then we're gonna ask them to stand on the circle. Um, we're gonna show them that next we get to dance with the scarf, and then the last thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go put the scarf away. So really simple, not complicated. Um, you'll notice that the pictures I have, I'm really focused in on the object and what I want to have happen. So it's just the container. It's just showing um, the child's feet standing on the circle. Um, then it's showing them dancing and then it's just the container again. So it's not the whole room. There's not a lot else going on. Um, it's really focused um, visually for the kids. So it's not confusing on what am I supposed to be doing in this um, in this picture if it's a busy picture. Other language considerations are to keep uh, the language simple that you're using um, and using an appropriate rate of speech. So um, if you are going to give directions to a child and you're gonna say, um, you know, hey everybody, it's time for circle time and we're gonna get ready for music next. I'm so excited. Okay, come on over, let's go. Come on everybody. All right, over to the circle. Um, that's a little bit too much. <laughs> so what we wanna do instead um, is just really use a nice rate of speech. And what we all do um, in our primary first languages is we talk fast. We've been doing it our, our entire lives. It's not hard for us, for most of us. Um, and so when we're using that high rate of speech, we're just decreasing the child's ability to process what we're saying. So the directions don't need to be overly dramatically slow and uncomfortable as if we think this child doesn't understand anything. Um, but we want to make sure that we're using a nice rate of speech that's not complicated. So the simple language that I've got up here looks like, come to the circle, and then we're giving wait time for those kids to be able to hear the directions and follow our directions. Um, wait time is hard. It's something I've had to practice and learn, and it's uncomfortable. We don't like it, but it's okay. So come to the circle, and then give your wait time sometimes of five to 10 seconds. That's okay. Um, and then after that, you're gonna just ask them to, you know, sit on a color, give them more wait time to sit on their color, and then I have a new book. So you're giving those directions, you're engaged, you're excited. Um, you, I'm not asking you to be boring, but what I am asking is what you can see on the bottom of the slide. Um, I have to hold my notes up so I can read all of this. But um, what we may say is, you know, everyone come to the circle, please, and find your favorite fun color to sit on. Today I have something very exciting to show you. Can you guess what it is? It's a new book. So I was engaging and I'm really excited and I said some great things, but I used a lot of words to communicate it. And for our little ones, when we're doing sensory story time, um, it's just not the most effective way. Um, there's a lot of language that you have to process through to really understand the expectation of, I just need to go to the circle and I need to sit down and I'm gonna read a book. 
So um, those are things to think about and, and they do take practice and that's okay. Um, but when you think you're not talking quickly, we probably all are. So it takes practice. Other things to think about, um, a child's understanding of language is probably um, more than likely higher than what their verbal speech is. So a lot of times children on the autism spectrum do have language delay and we see that in their expressive language. So their first words are delayed, their ability to say a phrase or a sentence is delayed, but many times their understanding of language or their receptive language skills are really um, are higher or in, even within the normal range. So um, just because a child isn't able to verbally communicate with you during story time um, or while they're in the library doesn't mean that they're not understanding what's being said. So um, again, everything is the spectrum, but just keep that in mind that um, there's a good chance that that is the case for the child. Another thing um, that we see happen a lot is children repeating the last word of a question or a phrase. And when kids are doing that, they're not understanding what's being said. So if we read a story and we say, you know, why did he go home? And the child just repeats, why did he go home or home back to you? Um, it's just a good indication to you that this child probably isn't understanding why questions yet. So um, don't be frustrated by that. Just know that um, the understanding isn't quite there and we may need to simplify the questions um, if we're asking that of the kids. Um, some other helpful things that I just thought of, um, I wanted to tell you guys, um, I kind of talked about them already here. Um, the colorful rubber dots on the floor to indicate where to sit or stand is really helpful. Um, hula hoops are a really good way for kids to see physically their own space to be inside. Um, it also gives them a little buffer. Um, my own four-year-old needs a hula hoop around her so that she can stay in her own spot um, and not be so on top of everybody else. Um, so that's a fun way to indicate space for kids to be in. Um, the clear tubs for sensory activities, I mentioned that. Um, music, I love music. And one thing that can frustrate me with music is that it's so fast. Um, so finding music that is not super fast for kids to be able to sing along with or do the actions with um, is really important. And I feel like it's a little bit harder to find. Um, cartoons are the same way. It's why I hate cartoons is because all the language is so fast. Um, so if you can do some research and try to find um, music that is slower, that um, allows the kids time to think about the directions, it's what being said, um, that's really beneficial. Um, and if you can't find it, then maybe you just get to be, <laughs> be the music without a CD playing or, um, or your phone. Um, and you know, kids are forgiving, they don't care what our voices sound like. So that's just one thing uh, to keep in mind as well. I think handouts for families are really important so that they know, um, the why behind what you're doing. So why do we have the sensory experiences? Why are we doing this? Um, and getting their feedback and how things are going um, is, um, is really important because they're the experts on their kids and they may have some great ideas on how to engage their child, their other children in the room. Um, so never forget that those parents are a great resource and also um, don't forget to educate them and give handouts on why you're doing um, what you're doing and explaining story time and really being um, considered about who story time is for when it's the sensory story time because um, you've got a focused audience for that. So uh, repetition of the same book week to week is okay. I think if you want to do the same book for four weeks in a row uh, to not hesitate to do that that just builds that schedule that we were talking about, the expectations, um, the child knows what they're gonna do when they get there. And I think that's really great um, to have that predictability for them. And then if you do choose to do that on that week four, maybe int introduce your new book for the next week so that they know the book's gonna change. So um, really um, making sure that kids are aware of the change that's happening so it doesn't catch them off guard because that can also happen. So being able to give them a handout 
uh, with the book on it so that they can see the book and, and let them know next week when you come, we're gonna read a new book. Here's what our new book is called and give that handout to the parents so that they can talk with their kids about um, what to expect next week because um, again, those schedules and predictability are really important. So um, talking about limiting the number of kids in the room, um, I would say when you're starting out, really try to keep um, a five to one ratio um, just so that as you're getting used to how things go, you're not overwhelming yourselves. Sensory story time with 20 kids on your first time is, is going to be a little bit um, overwhelming. So trying to um, maybe limit that so that you, you know you can be successful and not overwhelmed. Um, I linked a blog post about sensory story time down there if you guys want to see that. It, um, it's just another way to look at what we've been talking about. Um, I want to look at questions quick. I know I'm running short on time. Um, and the last things that I've got are just kind of about the parents. Um, so using carpet squares is a great idea too. Um, so difference between story time and sensory story time. Um, so I would, you know, when you're thinking about story time for again, like four and under, sensory story time is probably not a lot different. Um, but story time for maybe kids is, kids six and up um, is not going to be the same as sensory story time. I would expect a six-year-old to be able to sit for 15 to 20 minutes um, to do at a table to listen to a story and then maybe doing a sitting activity. So to me, that's really where the big difference is, is um, that ability to sit in one spot and engage um, with a book. Uh, sensory story time is really trying to break up that experience and provide those sensory experiences in between um, and take into the consideration of noise, lights, um, those, those other sensory environmental things that we've talked about. Um, my slides will be available. I've turned those in, so I know that they're going to put those up. Um, any other questions that I missed? I don't think I missed. Uh, Lacey, if you could, I think you maybe put the link to the blog post to just the presenters. So if you want to go oh. to your chat box and change it, because I didn't see it come through. The link to the blog post? Yes. Okay. Yep. I can do that. Um, I have to figure that out on my, <laughs> my PowerPoint. One second here. Um, Did I, I thought I heard you say you put it in the chat? No, I put it on. Oh, okay. Um, it's right. in the PowerPoint slides. Never mind then. That's fine. I thought, I thought you said it went through the chat. So no, that's fine. We can get it off the, okay. the PowerPoint. Okay. Right there for you. So there we go. Thank you. Yep. Um, so uh, I, I did put in a part about parents um, because I know that the libraries in your towns are um, community places for your families. And so I just wanted to put a, a little bit of a shout out there. Um, when thinking about these kids, we need, also need to think about their parents. Um, sorry, I'm trying to advance my slides. So these parents are dealing with a lot. Um, you know, they're all in different stages of knowing if their child is diagnosed with autism or maybe not knowing. Um, but they've got, you know, a wide range of emotions that they're feeling. Um, many times they feel alone. They're not sure where to turn to. Um, they feel like, you know, their kids don't fit in anywhere. Um, and so really trying to make these story times an accepting place and hearing those parents out on their concerns and their ideas and what they're feeling is really important. So um, just know that um, those parents are experiencing a lot of things. Um, and so we want to be considerate um, of those feelings and, and to listen to them and, and to really um, just be understanding of, of how they're feeling and what life looks like for them. So um, I think I can end it there. If there's any other questions, it's 1130. Thank you all for attending. Uh, it's very exciting to have everyone. Yes, as a parent with a child suffering from ADHD, um, I agree, I have those, those same feelings. So um, thank you everyone. Uh, I, I did, in at the end of the slides um, that you'll be able to get, I've included um, my name and my email address. So if you've got questions, feel free to reach out. Um, I'd be happy to answer those questions. Um, as you're working on this, um, if you uh, 
uh, think of other things that you don't think of right now, uh, again, feel free to reach out. Um, we just want kids to be successful and for you guys to be successful and for everyone to have a good time. This was wonderful. Thank you very much, Lacey. Super informative and just filled and filled with lots of great ideas. Um, I think you all are responding in the comments there, but Lacey, your passion for working with kids really came through. And I hope it's sort of contagious and, and everybody is, is able to take some of these great ideas back to their library. So officially, thank you very much. I appreciate you being here and presenting for us. And thanks to everyone who attended and um, are commenting in the chats for us. Yeah. So thank you all. All right. Thank you, guys. Have a good rest of your day and enjoy your other sessions.